Hi everyone, um, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's panel discussion and I'm delighted that you're joining us and our panel of female graduates from Abbey Road Institute London to mark International Women's Day. Um, it's great to have so many of you watching this evening and I really hope that you've enjoyed the full week-long Abbey Road Equalise Festival that's been created by the Abbey Road team and friends and peers of the studio as well. Um, the Abbey Road Equalised banner was created to support diversity within the music industry and to help inspire and empower underrepresented groups to consider a career in music production and engineering. Um, so today is the last day of the first ever Abbey Road Equalised virtual festival. Um, and there's been a whole host of different workshops, creative panels and one-to-one -one mentoring sessions. I'm sure quite a lot of you will have actually in, um, joined and enjoyed a lot of the events over the week. Um, and the engagement's been really fantastic um, from all over the world and the team and our group are basically talking about doing a lot more events throughout the year to support greater balance and diversity within the music industry. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm really excited to be hosting the final event um, and I think this evening's discussion is going to be really interesting. Um, firstly, I'd like to just give a bit of background um, in terms of who we are as the organisers of the, this evening's event in particular. So I'm Hannah, I'm part of the team at Abbey Road Institute. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the Institute, we are the educational arm of Abbey Road Studios. So we teach aspiring music producers and sound engineers. And we have schools across Europe, um, as well as Australia, South Africa, and also in the US as well. And the panel this evening is comprised of graduates from our London School, which is based, unsurprisingly, um, at Abbey Road in Northwest London. And our panel have all graduated and finished their studies with us within the last five years. Um, our first intake actually graduated in, in 2016, so quite, we're quite young as a school. Um, and they're all working in different jobs within music and more broadly within audio as well. Um, so whilst the programme that we teach is focused on music production and sound engineering, um, the group that we have with us this evening are working in a variety of different roles across the industry. So we have a jam-packed um, hour and a half planned for you. I'll be asking each of the panel to introduce themselves and say a little bit about what they do. I have a few questions to pose to the group as well to get the ball rolling. And then I'd love to invite those of you that are watching live to submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And I'll be picking up some of your questions a little bit later on and throwing them out to the group as well. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna invite our panel members to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna work around the group, ask them to say a little bit about what the job is that they're doing at the moment. And then also, if you could say a little bit about what inspired you to go into music in the first place. And I'm going to kick off with my colleague, Lucy, who's a member of the team here at Abbey Road Institute London. Hi, everybody. Um, happy International Women's Day. I'm so excited to be part of this. It's, it's so cool. Um, so I currently work with Hannah at the Institute. I do student admin and marketing. So basically, I'm kind of like the first point of contact for all people that want to study with us or just helping students like throughout their journey. And I also help Hannah with all like social media and website stuff. Um, I started in music. Um, I started studying music when I was 16, you know, doing the whole um, music performance thing. And from that age, I knew that it was something I really wanted to do as a career, um, performing in my part time, like, you know, outside of work. And I really wanted to work um, in the business. I didn't go to uni or kind of didn't really get along with any kind of traditional academic studies. So I decided to do a apprenticeship um, and I got an apprenticeship into Universal Music where I was working for the UMG labels in licensing. And basically what that means is I was working on albums such as Now That's What I Call Blah Blah, blah or Ministry of Sound. And I was working with um, different artists, managers and labels, getting copyright clearance um, for the albums. And after I did that for a year and a half, I I hopped over to Abbey Road and I've been here for a year and a half as well. So um, yeah, that's pretty much me. I am a songwriter, a singer in my spare time. Um, and yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Lucy. Um, Ramira? Hello, um, I'm Ramira. Uh, I am currently an assistant engineer at Metropolis Studios, which is in Chiswick. Um, 
pretty iconic building and I really love spending almost every day here, as crazy as that sounds. Um, and I'm also a freelance sound engineer and vocal producer. Um, what made me want to get into music? Honestly, kind of mainly uh, family exposure. My family's very musical and I was exposed to um, like the whole family band over America can play drums and dad will play bass, that kind of thing um, from a very early age. And so as I kind of continue on um, in my uni degree um, at, in Canada, I started getting curious about how music is actually made and, and who works behind the scenes and got curious about um, the engineering and production side of things. So when I graduated um, from university in Canada with my bachelor's degree, I moved to London um, to pursue my advanced diploma with the Institute. And I graduated in 2018 and now I'm, now I'm here. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, Debbie, if you could go next. I'm Debbie. Um, before lockdown, I was working, I was just getting into musical theatre as a DEP, which is uh, someone who covers if somebody's away. And I was doing the cell number three job, which is looking after all the microphones backstage. Um, I got into music because uh, I basically grew up with music. My dad was a classical musician. My mum was really keen listener and I was at the proms all the time as a kid. I did a degree in music and then I had this massive circuitous thing where I did other jobs and then thought what am I doing and then ended up back in sound engineering and came to Abbey Road Institute and that's that really and now I am where I should be. <laughs> Brilliant thank you. Marta. Hi everyone uh, my name is Marta Maria Di Nozzi and I currently am senior runner uh, at Abbey Road Studios, that uh, means that I kind of manage the uh, runners team inside the studios. Uh, we're all part of uh, a bigger team, the engineering team, uh, where you can find the engineers, assistants, and you know, uh, everyone working uh, to record music in there, actually. Um, what inspired me to pursue a career in music? Well, uh, I started playing uh, guitar when I was quite young um, and uh, you know as I grew up as a teenager I had different bands of different genres and at some point I started uh, writing music my music and I, I I just wanted to understand how it was possible that my you know the records that I loved the most sounded that good um, and I couldn't do it by myself and I got to know that sound engineering existed. So um, I, I studied in my hometown, Rome, in Italy, and I got my bachelor's degree in there in sound engineering and uh, electronic music production. And after a bit of freelance working, uh, I decided to, to leave my country and just come here and study one year at the Abbey Road Institute. Um, and after that, I had an amazing opportunity of um applying for a job at abbey road studios and i've been working there for a year and a half now and uh, loving every minute <laughs> um yeah that's about it brilliant thank you um and lizzie hi um, i'm lizzie i am currently working as a studio intern at platoon which is basically i act as a kind of assistant engineer on sessions i do some editing work some mix prep work stuff like that um, and how I got into music I did a lot of music at school um, I studied music at university and at some point I, I really wanted to get into music production but didn't really know what that was and it took me a while to kind of find out what jobs are available and stuff like that I found the course at Abbey Road Institute graduated in 2019 um, and then after that, I've, I've worked at the BBC for six months on Radio 3. And then at the end of that, I somehow found my way to Platoon. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and Natalia. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalia, and I currently work as the head of the technical team at Abbey Road Institute. So I manage the team at our school. I graduated from Abbey Road Institute as well, and I'm also a freelance music producer, sound engineer and arranger. 
I've been doing most of the work that I've been doing for the past couple of years was with, with a producer called Youth, uh, Martin Glover. So he worked with like Pink Floyd and um, uh, Paul McCartney and that kind of stuff. So that is mainly what I've been doing. I'm also currently doing my master's degree in professional media composition, essentially film scoring. And oh, how I got into music was mainly, well, I played piano since a young age and then after that guitar and my family wasn't musical at all my family was very logical no one very creative I was the only little creative little strange person in the family and and yeah I played since I was very young I played the piano and the guitar and at some point I just started writing music I just started hearing it all in my head and I felt the necessity of studying it because I felt like to make it real because hearing it in your head is one thing but actually making it real and making other people listen to the music that you hear in your head you have to have the knowledge and that is essentially how I got into production and, and engineering and studying all that stuff that's all fantastic and that's me thanks Natalia and Mia Hi everyone, I'm Mia um, I work for the dance label Anjuna Deep. I'm a product manager um, and I also DJ and produce under the name Mia Aurora. Um, my main role is a product manager, which means I over oversee all the aspects of a release. So that's a song, an EP or an album. Um, and I've been doing that for six months now. Um, I graduated Abbey Road in 2019. Uh, what made me want to get into music? Uh, I started playing guitar when I was younger and my siblings also were really musical. So I've just kind of always been brought up around music. And I think I just decided when I was in my teens that like music was the my true passion, the one thing I loved and that's what I wanted to pursue. So I decided to try, go down the music path and so far it's going well. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. It's good to just to set the scene a little bit and get an idea of what, what everyone's doing. Um, I think one of the main kind of purposes for this evening's event is to give those of you watching a bit more of an insight into what these jobs involve. Um, the idea being that I'm, I'm sure quite a lot of you are interested in pursuing careers in the music industry or perhaps are kind of at the early stage and figuring out what it is that you might want to do longer term. Um, but what does that look like? Like what is a day like as a studio owner or an assistant engineer or, or behind the scenes um, at a label? So the first kind of question that I'm going to throw out to the panel is actually to ask you each to speak a little bit about like what does your job look like? Do you imagining that I guess perhaps we're watching have not um, worked in a recording studio and don't know what that experience is like, don't know what it's like at a label or, or the kind of working behind the scenes in the West End um, to give a bit of an insight to that. And I might start with the group that are working in, in the studio environment, I think, to get the ball rolling. Um, so perhaps Ramira, if you wouldn't mind saying a little bit um, about what it like, what does a day look like for you in the studio? What what does that entail? Like the preparation, the planning, the negotiation, Ooh, and it was a, a lot. There's a lot to cover. That's a lot. Um, I'll do my best to kind of put it into, I guess, the simplest, easiest terms possible. Um, as an assistant engineer your job is to just ensure that all aspects of a recording session run as smoothly as possible. And that goes across the board for anything technical related, musical related and hospitality related. So you have to just maintain the creative energy that's in the room by making sure that one, everyone is as comfortable as possible. Two, your engineer that you're assisting has everything that they've requested and that everything is working it's set up correctly and it's it's where they wanted it. Um, and three, that you're always prepared for what's gonna happen next. So it's just all about knowing what to anticipate um, during the session so you can sort it as soon as possible. Uh, I guess during a, during a session, we typically get a lot of vocal sessions at Metropolis at the moment, but let's say we are doing um, one of the events we do, which is called Live to Vinyl. And it's exactly what it sounds like <laughs> recording live to vinyl um, we usually get a tie sheet from the engineer and you're looped in with the artist that's performing their management their producers about how they're going to go about tracking um, whether or not they're going to track the main band without vocals and then do overdubs of the vocals later for example and you have to kind of do your setup accordingly um, it involves a lot of communication with your engineer about what gear they think they they want or is necessary for the song um and you just really have to be good with your time management and make sure that everything is set up 
and ready to go when the artist arrives. And throughout the session, obviously, you're making sure that, like I said, everyone is comfortable, teas and coffees. Um, yeah, <laughs> just to kind of maintain that, that energy. Thank you. I can see quite a bit of nodding and smiling from Marta. Is that similar to your experience? Good, I hope well? so. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, let, let's say that, uh, it, it, yeah, Ramera said that exactly what it is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a studio runner, uh, which, uh, of course, um, it's, it's slightly different from uh, what Ramera does, but basically uh uh in my experience i mean my job at abbey road studios the the runners are the first uh ones to arrive in the morning and the last ones to to leave the place in, in the evening or night um and we are basically <laughs> um making sure that every room in the building has whatever uh people or engineers or assistant need uh to run the session so um, part of my job is, of course, uh, being in, in a session and taking care of just one, but another part of my job uh, is also taking care of other rooms and other studios that at the same time are running and recording at Abbey Road. Um, another big part of my job is um, uh, organizing the booking of microphones because we have a lot of microphones and quite a few different rooms um so making sure that everything is ready for the setup um helping each studio with setup and pack down uh if there's something uh, broken or not functioning properly get it to the right place to get fixed um and then of course as ramera said uh, hospitality is is key um in this environment and make make sure that the client is um uh comfortable in any way possible uh that means of course that uh, supervising the session so the session goes well actually but that means also uh getting some teas and coffees or whatever uh, they need to 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 make them comfortable um so yeah it's it's kind of a at least my days are quite quite long and i'm sure <laughs> ramirez as well um definitely very long <laughs> yeah uh now of course we we will happen um uh, last year, uh, everything is slightly different, but, but yeah, that's that's it. Great, thank you. And Lizzie, how about your experience working at Platoon? Is that does that kind of mirror some of your your kind of work as well? Um, yeah, pretty much. My my Platoon is a bit smaller than um, where you guys work, so it's a little bit different. I also do a bit of like maintenance stuff and like keeping all the records of our equipment that doesn't work. We have a lot of analog equipment, so making sure that's all functioning as it should, which we have two very old tape machines, so that can be fun sometimes. But um, yeah, um, that's all I can really think to add to. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and then perhaps Debbie, and I, I realize the West End is obviously affected by things at the moment in terms of um, COVID and stuff, but thinking back to when you would have been going in um, into a physical workspace, what, what kind of things would you be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so I would go in and get all the mics. I was working at Thriller Live, by the way. I was there for a few months as a dep. Um, so I'd go in, get all the mics ready, get all the in-ear monitors ready, depending on who was on, because it checked they all had their own ones. Um, test the mics, test the in-ears, give them out to people, fit them if necessary. Um, and then during the show, just, uh, well, the, the, the name of the cell number three is kind of like mic runner. So I'd be taking mics to people because in Thriller you have different songs, like it's, it's, it's a jukebox musical, so you have a different song every few minutes on a different mic sung by a different singer. So I'd take a handheld mic to someone and then I'd put, fit a headset and then take it off and take another mic somewhere else. So I'd be doing that, uh, fixing any problems that happened during the show, swapping out equipment, uh, looking after the radio rack, making sure everything's transmitting and receiving okay. And uh, my favorite thing in Thriller was the guitar patches where we'd have a guitarist that would go off and walk around the stage. So I had to do the, the feet, <laughs> basically. <laughs> which was just 
amazing. It was just so much fun to do. The whole thing was so much fun, but that was my favourite thing. Thank you. Um, okay, and then perhaps um, Mia, maybe if you could say a little bit about the a bit more about the job that you do and what does that kind of entail on a day to day basis? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, I'm a product manager. Um, so this is overseeing everything about the release. So once the song, the EP or the album, uh, once we've signed it, I work closely with the artist and then other departments in the label to ensure that we give the release the best chance of success. Um, so I'll work closely with radio, streaming, marketing teams, um, deciding which radio stations we want to pitch to, which Spotify or Apple Music playlists we're going to um, aim to have the track on. Um, and we also um, work to create content for the release, which we use on social media to promote it. So this could be working with the artist to create studio breakdown videos for YouTube or live videos, live sessions, um, and also creating music videos and custom visual assets. Um, for the artists so they're kind of the main uh, things I do and then also working for a label um, there are a few like perks for like yourself so for me as an artist I'm able to do DJ mixes and live streams for Anjuna Deep which is like giving me the platform to promote myself as an artist and hopefully once events are back on I'll be able to DJ some events for them. Nice. That's good. Hopefully that won't be too far off then by the sound yeah, of things at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Natalia, if you could say a little bit, I mean, I know you definitely are wearing multiple hats for different jobs, um, <laughs> but a little bit of insight into the, the different roles that you're doing kind of more day to day basis. Yeah, I mean, as a freelancer, it, it, sometimes it becomes quite impossible to describe what you do, <laughs> but essentially... Mainly, my main work has been with youth, the producer that I mentioned for the past couple of years. And um, as as if I was mentored by a producer, as per se, like he's a well, very well-known producer and I was his engineer. But being an engineer that is musically trained, it also you end up doing other stuff. Like I would do lots of arrangements. Uh, sometimes I would co-produce things with him and mixing and editing recordings and record people. Uh, sometimes I was managing one of his labels as well and a classical ambient, a contemporary classical label. So I would do a bit of music business, sorting out contracts, uh, vinyl test pressings, listen to test pressings, get vinyl printed. I would do some artwork on all that kind of stuff or album covers. Uh, I organized some festivals with him, like music festivals. So events as well. It was all sorts of different things. And as a freelancer, it, it, the thing is that n there was no day that was re re repetitive or like like another one. Every day was was different and every day was exciting. And I've done all sorts of different things. So that was one of the good things for me of like the freelance work. You end up learning a lot and exploring different areas that sometimes you, you wouldn't even dream of the exploring. And then you end up doing it and realizing that you're good at many things in the music industry or that you can be so yeah that was essentially what I've been doing brilliant thanks Natalia um and Lucy yeah you're juggling both the work that you do at the institute and also establishing yourself as an artist do you want to say a little bit about the two and how you juggle between the two yeah um so I think I'm quite similar to Mia really obviously day to day I do a lot um with like Hannah marketing, I do a lot um, with, for the students getting to know everyone. And this has actually really helped me as an artist because before, like, unlike all these amazing ladies, I don't know anything about production or recording or anything. Um, I just like to write songs and sing. And I've been really lucky to meet some incredible producers that I can now work with um, and writers. Hayley, I write with Hayley, work with Max. And I've been lucky enough to record at the Institute. So it's really helped me learn so much and I've also been able to kind of learn a bit about things here and there um and yeah kind of that's I think that's pretty much it obviously I worked at a label I worked for UMG before so you kind of when you get to work in the industry you can kind of see the breakdown you learn about things automatically like music copyright how the how the label like you know tree works and how where an artist starts and how they can kind of you know, utilize different aspects of, of the industry to really help help themselves and make maybe smarter moves. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, well, next on, I was thinking that we'd be good to talk a little bit more about 
how you actually got to where you are and I, I appreciate we're all we're all together connected by the institute as you've all studied or worked at the institute um, but you've each come through different paths whether that's before studying or after that have led into the jobs that you are now um, and it'd be great to find out a little bit more perhaps a bit about how you actually got the job that you're doing now what led to that um, and just dig into that a little bit more and I'm going to take the same route round again so Ramira if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about how you how did you get the job at Metropolis what led to you starting your job there? It's so funny every time it circulates back to me I'm like oh I had all this time to think about what to say. <laughs> um, bit of a long-winded way as to how I ended up at, at Metropolis but um, it just started off with me actually getting my foot in to the actual building. So when I graduated from the Institute, I didn't think that I wanted to be um, a vocal producer or an engineer or even an assistant engineer here. Um, I wanted to songwrite. Um, like so many of the wonderful ladies on this panel, I also write my own songs and have started my own artist project. So I really wanted to um, come out of the Institute and start doing my songwriting thing. But I found that I kept getting discouraged and what ended up happening was I was just applying for any and every studio related, music related job, production related job that there was. And one of them was uh, the EQL, Spotify and Berklee College of Music um, Engineering Residency, which um, was hosted by Spotify in partnership with Berklee College of Music um, to have three women be their recording engineers or their kind of like in-house recording engineers um, at their Spotify Secret Genius Studios around the world. At the time, um, there were three. So there was one in Nashville, one in New York, and the one in London, which is coincidentally enough exactly where I'm sitting right now. Um, and the Spotify one, it was located at Metropolis Studios. So um, I started I started off doing things with Spotify and a lot of it was vocal sessions. Um, so I would manage the day-to-day -day, uh, um, the day-to-day -day operations of this little kind of production setup. And I have a little, I have a little eight channel desk here and I was still very much learning about signal flow and I didn't know much about production, but I was still working with, working one-on-one -on -one with um, bigger clients um, and higher profile names as the year went on. But when my contract eventually expired with Spotify, I was then more curious about actually getting my hands on one of the bigger desks in Metropolis. And I thought, I really want to challenge myself and explore the world of engineering. And I want to record bands. I want to, I want to explore vocal production after assisting some people in the Spotify room, like Cameron Gower Poole, who recorded um, the last Dua Lipa album. And yeah, I was really inspired by so many people while working here that I just wanted to do more. And so then I started um, running for Metropolis and I was a runner here for about six months and then COVID hit and I started um, assisting. And how, so you, you're, you have been working from home or all in the studio throughout? Are you like In the out? studio Did throughout. You, yeah. I haven't, yeah. <laughs> I think there were about two weeks at the beginning, but um, because uh, a lot of the office staff had left, it was down to the core team of the studio kind of like the heartbeat that kept us going and that was just the assistants and the engineers and tech so that's mainly who's been in at the studios recently okay so yeah. maybe it's a little bit of an unusual time not time to start in that job but to get to grips with stuff while things are yeah like really strange but it's been good because at the end of the day I was just kind of thrown into the deep end and it was like okay we're you got to sink or swim and I've managed to stay afloat metaphorically. Um, <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then Marta, maybe if you could say a little bit about how you got into the job that you're doing now. So um, it was a long, a long journey for me. I mean, that's how I feel about it. Um, I don't want to, you know, start too early, but uh, just a bit of context. Um, when I finished my uh, high school, uh, I was 18. Uh, I didn't think I would have, I, I had the talent to, to pursue a career in music as a musician. So I decided to study something else. And I actually studied for, for five years architecture in Rome. And, uh, uh, you know, an experience that 
um, it took me years to understand that it was not a failure because um, I used a lot of years of my life and while I was studying, I was also um, studying music um, in, a, in a school and, in, you know, learning new instruments and writing my own music. So uh, at the end of those five years, um, I decided it was not for me. Uh, I was not feeling good about it. I, I wanted I wanted to do music. Um, so I found another course in my hometown that could uh, help me learn um, about what I needed to learn. Uh, so I, I just started this new chapter of my life uh, at the time and I didn't know where that would, would lead me to somewhere or not. Uh, and when I graduated, I did a lot of freelancing, uh, but I couldn't find any opportunities in, uh, in studios. Um, so uh, at some point, I just decided that it, it was the time for me to do something. Uh, so either stay where I was uh, or, or try and to, to pursue a career in a studio somewhere else. Um, and that's when I found the Institute. Uh, I, I needed, I, I felt like uh, after a lot of years of, of theory, I needed something more practical knowledge. Uh, I, 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 it, my idea was, if I have to go to a studio uh, and ask for a job there, I don't want to be, I, I want to know what's happening around me. I don't want to, you know, start from scratch where I, I don't know what people are talking about. Um, so after the year at the Institute, actually, that really helped me understand my skills, what I need to improve uh, and and the amazing opportunity of being uh, part of the technicians team there after I graduated, uh, that really, uh, really helped me put a foot in, uh, in the industry, really. Um, and after six months that I was working at the Institute as a technician, uh, I got to know that next door there was an opening for a runner's position. Um, so I just applied for the job, really. I sent my CV uh, and I received a call saying, hey, can you come and uh, uh, we can have a chat about it and you can have a trial day uh, if, you, if you are interested. Of course, there were other people uh, applying for the job that I, I don't know about, uh, as many jobs, uh, uh, but at the end, uh, I got it, and I, I still don't believe it today. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how I ended up at Abbey Road. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm guessing the novelty is not wearing off, off yet, walking through the double doors uh, every day. It depends how late at night it is. <laughs> Uh, when I, uh, whenever I come back from a holiday or something, I still will, you know, take a look at the front door and I'm like, can't believe I work here. I've been working here for a year and a half now. Uh, but yeah, amazing. Nice. Yeah, I still get that feeling. I think seeing you last week, because we had a session with our students last Thursday, which is the first session we've had this year. We we're back in Studio One and the excitement of being back in the studio with real musicians and live music, it just gives you goosebumps, basically. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Lizzie, maybe you could say a little bit, because you mentioned that you worked at the BBC as well um, before you are where you are now. So it'd be great just to hear a little bit about that journey as to how you got there. Yeah, so, well, when I was a student at the Institute, I managed to get on a work experience placement at the BBC for a couple of weeks. I was with the television doing the proms coverage. Um, so that was a good, like, thing for the CV, and I think that really helped me. And then... When I graduated from the Institute, I saw a job going as a sound engineer for Radio 3, which I applied for and really didn't think I would get it because it was kind of a dream job since I was a kid because I, I always would, would watch the proms on TV and um, I was really interested in that classical kind of stuff. So, yeah, somehow um, I got that job and did that, I did that for six months on a contract and I would still be freelancing there now if it wasn't for all the live events being cancelled, which is a bit sad. But um, yeah, that was great. And then uh, quite luckily on the last day that I was working there, um, I got a call from Carlos, one of the teachers at the Institute, telling me about my current job and basically asking if he could uh, recommend me. Um, so 
my current job, I got on a personal recommendation, which, um, you know, I was really lucky to get. And yeah, I think that shows how networking can help and all that kind of thing. Yeah, great, thank you. And do you think, um, obviously I, I, I know things are different at the moment with, with live events and things, but is that, a, is that a route that you would pursue again in the future when things change and stuff starts to open up again? Is that work you'd like to do again, perhaps further down the line? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the plan was to keep doing that freelance anyway, but um, yeah, it's just a shame they just canceled all their freelance contracts because um, there's nothing, I mean, it was meant to be like big Glastonbury anniversary, Olympic, like there was so much that was meant to be on this year that's just, or last year, that's not happened. And yeah, but I, I really miss doing radio and I hope I can again someday in some, in some capacity. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, yeah, it's, we don't know yet, but hopefully with things starting to plan to be opened up again, that these things will be back on the cards again, whether yeah, it's kind of later on this year or for next year, for sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to move over to Debbie, um, if you want to say a little bit. So I know you also, you worked at Metropolis a bit when you graduated and then kind of things are now West End, which I know is different again, but it'd be great to hear more about that. Um, yeah, I started as a runner at Metropolis uh, just after Abbey Road, um, which I loved, but I was still just trying to find exactly where I fitted into sound. I still hadn't found it yet. And ironically, we, we had a live event, um, which was just a panel discussion. Um, and I've kind of, I'd never mixed anything live before. So I thought I really wouldn't mind just having a little go on the mixer, just of these, these people talking. So I kind of stood nearby and the guy doing it said, but I, I really need to go to the loop. Can you just take over for a minute? And I was like, yes, I can. So <laughs> I did that and I, I loved it. And I thought this is what people in musicals do. You, it's, you, you turn it up when they're talking, you turn it down when they're not. That's, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do that. Because um, I've been wondering about it, but not really knowing whether I really could or would want to. And I did, I loved it. So I went to a company called Orbital Sound who do um, basic, basically, uh, they supply they're a hire shop basically, but they do loads of other stuff as well. So they do courses and I did a couple of days courses there. And part of the course was uh, a field trip to see backstage at Thriller Live. So we went and did that and I got in touch with the head of sound there afterwards asking for work experience, which is what you usually do. You can visit a show for a couple of days. Um, and he said, well, actually, can you come in and be a dep? So I went in and they, they teach you the job first, uh, they teach you the show, and then the rest is history. I just ended up being there for ages, <laughs> and it was great, really, really cool. Brilliant. Thanks, Debbie. Um, okay, I'm going to move over to um, Mia. Perhaps if you could say a little bit about your kind of journey to getting to where you are, where you are now. Yeah, so before the Institute, I did two years at Leeds College of Music. So that's when I was 16 to 18. Um, and the course was music technology. So um, it was quite varied. We did live sound, music production, music business. Um, and then after that, I knew I wanted to move to London and I was looking at what courses would be suitable. Um, and then when I found the Abbey Road course, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely really interested in doing that. So I started the Abbey Road course. Um, and through the course, I then found out about this Facebook group called Normal Not Novelty. So it's a Facebook group which basically promotes females in the music industry. You can promote your music, ask questions, help people out. It's a really good Facebook group. And in the Facebook group, I actually found out about the, an internship at Anjuna Deep. And because I'd heard of the label, I was really into their music. I was like, well, I'm definitely going to apply for this, but I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and it was just at the end of my year at the Abbey Road Institute, so it was kind of perfect timing. So I applied for the internship, had an interview and got the internship. So initially it was a four month internship as a label assistant, which was then extended to a year. And then after the year, um, I was promoted to a product manager, which was in October. And that's where I am now. Nice. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and Natalia, if you could give us a bit of background as well, that would be great. 
Yeah, so basically, I mean, there's so much has happened and as far as I can remember, I can't remember everything that happened. But I always say that if one tiny little thing had happened different, I would be in a completely different place right now because my career is basically based on networking and meeting people. You're in a session, someone brings someone, you introduce to someone else and you end up being in another session and another project. So the whole of my career was, was built on this. And one of the biggest things that happened is that at some point at the Institute, we had a guest lecture with this producer, youth, Martin Glover, that worked with so many wonderful people that I looked up to, like Paul McCartney and Pink Floyd, Kate Bush, who worked with all these people who came in for a guest lecture. That is how I was introduced to him. And I ended up working on two albums that were released by one of his labels. And he really liked my work on these albums and everything that I was doing, arranging, recording, mixing. And then I ended up working with him as a regular on a freelance basis, but as a regular being one of his um, recording engineers and mixing engineers and doing a lot of arrangement as well. And from there, just being on sessions and meeting other people and that recommended me to other people. And then that is basically how it was built up. So it was basically a series of events of networking with people, really. And that is how I got in, into the industry. So I guess that, that is, would summarise it. There are many other factors, but that would summarise my experience. Thanks, Natalia. It sounds quite a few of you mentioned networking. It seems like it's a really key. There are lots of nods of heads there. Um, I guess starting to establish who you are, meeting people, recommendations, building up those relationships that then lead to further opportunities as well. Um, and then Lucy, do you want to give us a bit more of context to how you got to where you are today as well? Sure, there was actually a question as well about when I mentioned earlier doing my apprenticeship and how you might um, get one, so I'll answer that as well. Um, basically, I'm someone who I don't really get along with like traditional academic learning, I can't concentrate, I'm more of like a hands-on learning person, like I'll just, if you show me how to do it then I can do it, and um, so then obviously I thought okay that's kind of what an apprenticeship is so I started searching on um, the government website um, and all those kind of places and I applied for one at well I applied for as many as I could find but I, the one I applied for it at, um, at Universal I got but if you're interested in looking for an apprenticeship I recommend the government website um, Diva Apprenticeships and Big Creative Education they're all like London based so um, I can't help anyone else who's outside of that um, but for anyone who's in London that's a great place to start and advice on how to actually get it I'd say there's one thing that always sticks in my mind and my manager at Universal I got I, I like from Brighton like, I'd never really been to London that much and I got invited to go to the Universal buildings and I was like oh my god and one thing that sticks in my brain is that my manager said of all the people that she interviewed she's never known anyone so excited just to be allowed in the building and just kind of like having that like pure like passion and excitement about the job and and just being kind of talkative and 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 while I was in my job I, I managed to get the job at Abbey Road because obviously with most internships you have the choice to be kept on or not it's through networking I made sure that I like now still now I'm part of the LGBTQ committee where we run like the pride events and stuff for UMG the charity committee I made sure to even just like smile at people in the in the lift every morning and all of those kind of things and I think that's definitely how I've managed to like keep on um in my career and how new opportunities keep popping up I don't think like um yeah without without doing that kind of stuff that definitely keeps the ball rolling brilliant thank you <laughs> um I'm going to add on to that because I'm just having a quick look at the Q&A and I have a few more questions but actually I'm going to pick out a few of the ones that are already starting to pop up, which I think are really relevant. Um, and I think this probably applies possibly to everybody on the panel. Um, we have a quick question from Christina. Um, it sounds like some of you are able to balance musical side passions alongside your work. Um, that, well, the question is, is unique to Abbey Road Institute, but I think this is probably more as in the jobs that you're doing now. How do you balance say if you have a, a full-time job and a part-time job and client work and then also doing stuff outside of that um are your employers generally cool with that um is it a challenge in terms of juggling between the different things that you do um perhaps Ramira if you're happy to go for that first because I know you, you juggle with freelance work as well as a full-time job mm -hmm. and for the most part well, no, not for the most part. The, my employers are very cool with it, but 
they're cool with it because that's how important it is to network. You need to be able to maintain your relationships with your current employers, your freelance clients, make sure that your freelance clients know that you might not always be available. There's always that kind of big question mark as to whether or not I'm going to be pulled on a different session. But, you know, if you'd like to come and record some drums, I can only let you know on Thursday if I can record you on Friday type of thing, you know. So um, it's all about a balance. And about my artist, my artist stuff and being able to manage my own time, I honestly haven't been able to do it for a while. Um, I released one single in and uh, at the end of November, um, but that was like three years in the making. <laughs> but that's on me because I feel like part of my songwriting stuff is part of my self care as well, and so making time for myself is also making time for my songwriting and everything like that. Like it kind of loops in with all of the things that make me feel good and make me feel like me and help me balance work life um, because I don't really view my songwriting as work um, even though I'm exposed to something similar every day I don't know did I answer the question <laughs> yeah no that was really good do, okay do you, so do you have I guess more ambitions to be writing and releasing more of your own music in the future alongside the day job and the freelance work that you're doing as well. If I'm honest, there are actually a couple of women in the industry already that are um, like Natalia, kind of balancing many different things and wearing different hats, um, namely Camille and Rafaela, who are both songwriters, vocal producers, artists in their own right, but also mainly write for bigger names like Little Mix and Anne Marie, etc. Um, so I really would would like to model my career after theirs, and you know, be able to write songs, but also engineer um, higher profile clients, um, but also kind of sprinkling in a little bit of of my own music on the side when I have time. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna jump to Natalia actually because I think Ramira made a, a good point there. I know Natalia, you are. You're working and juggling across a lot of different things. Yeah, it's, it's time management all along. It's like it's one of the most important skills that you can develop is time management. Do the, do yourself a favor. And if you're bad at time management, figure it out because you're going to need it. So that is basically what I do because I have my work with the Institute. But as head of the technical team of the Institute, I do freelance work as in mixing, um, recording, and I'm doing my master's degree, which is like, I have to compose a piece a month, like a film score a month, a short cue, but like, it is just a lot of stuff. And it's just, I just have to make sure that I allocate the right time for the right things. And on top of that, you have to take care of yourself, obviously. So you have to find time to exercise, to, I don't know, meditate. I do all this stuff. Like today I woke up at six in the morning, I did my meditation, I did my exercise, I went to work, I got home, I'm here when I finish here, I'm going to probably write one of my pieces for my, my master's degree. So it's like, everything has to be allocated. And I revise my calendar like every week. And I make sure that I allocate everything. It might, there's some sort of flexibility, I might have to change some things. But essentially, it's just organization and, and time management, just be organized. And, and then you can juggle between many things as much as you want and, and just enjoy what you do. Because I think there's another thing that you have to do. In order to do all these things, you have to be feeling good when you're doing it. Because if you're doing something that you don't like, obviously everything's going to feel like a, a task and like, oh, I have to do this. 100% oh agree. So yeah. So if you like what you're doing, you're going to do 100 things and you're still going to feel energized and like you want to do it. So I think that's, that's the key. Thank you. A lot of juggling going on. Um, and how about the rest of the panel? I think there's a few others. Marta, does that also apply to you? Are you, because I know you're doing very long hours at the studio, but do, are you able to squeeze in other stuff around that? Um, so um, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult uh, answer for me because when I started my job at Abbey Road, um, it was such a demanding that at the beginning uh, I felt a bit overwhelmed. I, I had a moment in which after a few weeks I had to stop, look at the mirror and say, okay, so I have to come with a plan because uh, I, I need to, 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 you know, take the pace of this thing. And um, 
and I was actually taking all my energies and all my effort just to try and learn the job every day, uh, being there all the time. Um, so I would say that it took a while for me to actually have the energies and, and as Natalia said, the time management skills to uh, squeeze in something else that was also um, feeding my creative part. Um, I don't have much time, unfortunately, to to do that, but but I I have some. So when I'm home, I like to still do some production to to still even if it's not exactly uh, you know um, a freelance job, of course, uh, since I have a full time one. But it's for me and to kind of recharge my energies because I I understood that uh, half of me or maybe a bit more than a half of me, it's is. Um, completely okay with what my uh, full-time job gives me back um, but I also need uh, uh, the other part of me needs something else to fuel the whole thing to to kind of work properly uh, so to reply to the question yes uh, probably not as much as I was uh, used to before getting this job but still enough to kind of um, uh, give give me back something, some energy to put into my uh, everyday job. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I might move over to to Mia because you mentioned before you you're working both as a as a product manager, but then you're also releasing your own music as an artist, and you're talking about DJing. How did those things all kind of sit side by side? Um. So before I started my job, I was definitely producing a lot more because I just had more time and energy. And I think maybe the first six months of uh, working for the label, I kind of put it on a pause so I could like really focus on like getting stuck in and getting to know the label. Um, and then, um, and just quite a lot of people at my work also DJ. So like there will always be events and sometimes after work we'll all DJ together in the office and stuff. So that kind of like motivated me to like really step up the DJing more. Um, and then because of Corona, then uh, we all started working from home, which the only perk is saving the commuting time, which for me is like an hour each way. So it's like an extra two hours a day now that I have to like work on music, finding new artists, that kind of stuff. So um, it is hard to like juggle doing the job and then working on your own thing, but I've definitely found the time more recently to do it. Thank you. Um, and Lizzie, how about you? Are you focused? Is it primarily the job that you're doing at the moment? Are you kind of also doing additional stuff outside of that? Um, prime, well, yeah, I mean, hopefully soon when things open up, because I also freelance in live sound as well, usually. And so hopefully I will start doing like other stuff as well. I still try and make time for like instrumental practice. Um, as well, like Romero said, for self-care, like I never thought about it like that, but it definitely um, is like that for me. And also I think it feeds back so much into like what I do for my day job, um, just having those musical skills and doing other music stuff, I think is really good and healthy and helpful. <laughs> Thank you. And how about you, Debbie? I know that you're in a kind of slightly different industry, as it were. But are there are there other things, or is that your like your primary focus in terms of the live sound? I'm really lucky. It's just my primary focus. So when I'm working, that's what I'm doing. And if I'm not working at the moment, I'm not working. I've I'm at a slightly different life stage to everyone else. So I own a flat that I rent out, and that's my income. Um, and it's just great. So at the moment, I'm just learning as much as I can. Uh, reading and watching videos, of webinars and stuff like this. But, <laughs> um, but when I was younger and I was working full time, um, I, I wanted at one point to be a singer and an actor and I played two instruments as well. And I have to say I was completely useless at coming home and doing any practice whatsoever. So I really admire everyone. I just didn't have, I was like, oh God, I can't. And the days would just go past. So yeah. <laughs> I can empathise with that. <laughs> um, and Lucy, how about you? I know you touched on this before, but um, like juggling between the two, how do you how do you make that work? 
Um, I think Natalia really solidified the point of time management and that is what I have to do. Sometimes it can be so exhausting, especially because obviously my day job is like marketing and stuff. And then as an artist, I have to keep up the social media stuff, you know, trying to do cover here every week, post every other day, it, trying to get the followers up. It can be quite exhausting. Um, so definitely just prioritising rest, turning off screens after a certain time. Um, I like have social media calendars for work and for my outside of stuff like I plan my posts out um I like book in writing sessions like a few weeks ahead so I kind of can like prepare and get things all in um and yeah but it's all fun like I, I enjoy it so much it's what I want to do I also work with a radio station as LinkedIn radio in my spare time as well where I do um just some like admin stuff and um I'm putting on some like festivals when things open up which can be really fun and I think it's easy to juggle when you when you love it like if you begin to hate it then just you know it's probably time to like rein it back a bit um but as long as you love it and you can find the time for it you will find the time for it and it will be fun and enjoyable so just keep along along those lines I reckon brilliant thank you Lucy um okay I'm having a look through the thread of questions in the Q&A and um there's a couple of topics which come up and which feel quite pertinent considering it's International Women's Day. Um, one of which from Celia, which is, what advice would you give to a woman that is starting out in music production and wants to put her music out? Um, been dreaming about releasing music um, and is now trying to, I think, overcome the hurdle of actually making that happen and going ahead with it. Um, do we have any tips or suggestions from the panel about that? And maybe there's something in there around perhaps confidence about doing it as well, which can be quite a big thing is like putting yourself out there and um, being open to receiving feedback. Um, perhaps for Miri, because you mentioned that you released, because you released your first single last year, it'd be really interesting to hear your experience about that. Like if you had to overcome any particular challenges to do that, any advice, because you've gone through that not so long ago. Um. I'll try to be as concise as I can be because it was a struggle and a lot of it was my self-confidence and knowing that, you know, I'm not signed, I'm completely independent and I just, I grew up in music, I'm a pianist, I'm a drummer, I'm a singer and I vocal produce for other people, but I want to do it for myself and there was a song that I wrote that meant a lot to me and seemed to resonate with a lot of the people that had already listened to it and my producer, who is also a graduate from the Institute, um, he and I worked through it so many times and, the, and there were different versions and we had different uh, musicians playing on it. Um, and then the thing that, uh, actually the thing that made me um, finally decide to put it out and realize that I actually did one release music of my own was I had a push of encouragement from Gary Barnes, who is the bassist um, from Chic primarily, and Ralph Roll, who is their drummer. Um, and they both heard the song and they really liked it. Um, and at the end of the, uh, at the end of all of it, they actually were, are the ones that are playing drums and bass on the, on the track. But hearing from them that it was a good song and like, hey, if you like it, why, why don't you want to put it out? It's because you're scared of the backlash or um, I was comparing myself to other artists that had marketing and social media and like management and all sorts of PR behind them. But at the end of the day, you know, it wasn't going to be my main source of income. And I was really happy with what I had in front of me. So there was nothing holding me back anymore from putting it out. But it did take a long time for me to, to come to grips with that. Um, but it's all up here. <laughs> Or it was for me anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I would say that if if it's something that you're passionate about and and you, you know, I think getting feedback from your peers and um, people whose opinions you value is really important as well. So I would send it out to um, other friends that are maybe in production as well and get some opinions there and just pitch it to um, as many people as you can and... I don't know put your heart out there because otherwise if you don't make the decision to do it you won't do it was it it sounds like it was quite a collaborative experience then from the from the initial kind of conception of the song in terms of the idea and the songwriting to the actual release you had like various different people involved from in different aspects and different roles is that right yes definitely and again even though there were a lot of people involved I myself was still not convinced 
that I wanted to put it out. So it's really down to, it's really down to you. Thank you. Um, Mia, I'm going to ask you to give your perspective as well as someone else that's also releasing their own music. What's, what's your experience around that in terms of, do you have any kind of advice you'd have to someone that's trying to overcome that hurdle of having the confidence to put something out there? Yeah, I would definitely say like what Mar uh, R Ramirez said that my biggest kind of issue was self-doubt or not feeling that, you know, I like the track or whatever. Um, which I think like everyone experiences and it's normal to, to feel, but the best uh, thing that I felt I did was just sending it to my friends. Um, and then from my friends, maybe to people that had a bit more experience in music and producing that could then give me feedback, constructive feedback. Um, that really helped, definitely. Great, thank you. And Lucy, I'm gonna move over to you next because I know this is a subject close to your heart. How about you? Yeah, I think sometimes you can be, well, not sometimes, always as musicians, as probably female musicians as well, producers, whatever, you can be your own worst critic. Like it's never gonna be as bad as you think it is to put stuff out there. I I stopped creating music until lockdown. And I think that not being around people and not like having to walk into work and see people like knowing that they've watched my videos or whatever, like gave me the confidence to do it again. And I posted my first cover and it got reposted by Haim. And I was like, what the hell? How does that even happen? And it just made me feel like, oh, sometimes you have to do it. Like sometimes you just have to do it. Like stop stop worrying about what's going to happen and something good might actually happen like all the times you're the most scared I can guarantee like it actually be way better than you think it is and I think like all the time I'm nervous to post things that are my own music things that I'm doing but the positive feedback and like the community that you can make from just doing it like actually just gives me the confidence to do it again and then again and again I kind of constantly am rebuilding it up but I'm keeping going and then it all comes together and it, it can be it can be great and like guarantee you're just it's all in your head like honestly you're not going to be that bad whatever happens it's not going to be that bad so just do it <laughs> <laughs> that's good lots of nods there as well thank you Lucy um okay I'm going to take another question from um the Q&A and uh, we have another topic which just kind of popped up oh actually sorry Marta go on you wanted to add in as well yeah sorry it's just um um, it's something quite close to my heart because um, uh, I was an artist for for a while, and uh, I, I when I went solo and I didn't have a band anymore, uh, I wrote my own EP, I produced it, I recorded it, I mixed it, and never came out. So if I <laughs> if I can say something about this to help someone, I will. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to say is that I understood that um, what what um, one of the things that matters the most in terms of from the outside is to have a product. So if you don't release anything, you do not create um, a reason for other people to engage with you in the sense that you don't have a link uh, because they don't know what's in your mind. Or they don't know what you're working in your studio if you don't release things. So the idea of not putting something out for fear of people to listen to it is just completely counterproductive. Uh, the second thing that I learned at my expense, if I don't, don't aim to perfection, because one, perfection doesn't exist. Uh, second of all, it's completely subjective. So if you set the bar too high, uh, you're never going to achieve it and you're never going to release anything. That, that brings to point one. Um, the third point that brings to point one again is if you uh, set the bar too high, you're basically creating, a, creating an excuse for yourself to not release music and you're justifying yourself in doing it. And all of this is counterproductive and brings to point one. So sorry for the interruption, but I kind of feel like, you know, it's really, really something close to my heart. So my, my advice is just do it go release it show the world who you are don't don't be afraid ask your friends ask people you know ask for help do it because everybody started from somewhere uh not even the the be the the person that won the most grammys in the more grammys in the world uh was born with a guitar in their hands or with a microphone in their hands so just go for it 
to interrupt. Brilliant. Thank you. I think you hit the nail on the head there. That was such a good summary. I, it's interesting. It, it echoes sentiments that I um, I think I experienced in a previous job before I joined Abbey Roads. And um, I worked somewhere where we had a culture very much around don't strive for, protect, for perfection, like strive to get stuff done and actually lower your kind of uh, your expectations a little bit, because if we're constantly aiming for something to be perfect before we put ourselves out there it will always come up against that hurdle of like it's not quite where it could be um and you learn through doing stuff and also making mistakes and failing at things as well which is terrifying but it's very true it's the best way to learn really never consider it a failure thank you that was really good does anybody else want to add any other comments to that question no okay thanks Marta. that was really good um, I'm going to move on to the next question in that case, which um, let me just have a quick look. And I think, again, this is probably relevant to quite a few of you. So we've got someone, we've got Lauren, who's asking as a freelancer. Um, so she's a freelancer, drummer slash musician, but I think more broadly asking about the best way to, fly, uh, to find clients to record, perform for, um, or is there a way of working for labels or agencies as a musician? Um, and she's looking to find the right way, I think, perhaps to network and make those connections. Um, I was wondering, Natalia, perhaps if you wouldn't mind saying a few words from your experience. Yeah, sure. I, I would say, I think the first thing, if you're willing to, um, if you're open to new experiences, that is the first step. Like always, not always say yes, but if you think that is something that is good for you, then say yes. Like, it, you just have to be willing to go out there and that links with what Marta was saying because that is not just for releasing music but also for recording engineers for mixing engineers for anyone it's like don't fear don't go like oh I'm not good enough no one is good enough you're always learning that is the principle of being alive you're always going to learn till the day that you die you're going to learn something new so you, you have to have a certain basic knowledge obviously to be in a studio to operate the things of course, there's stuff that's going to happen that you're going to be like, okay, what to do now? And you're going to learn it as you do it. So as a musician, as a producer, as an engineer, if there's an opportunity, you go for it. And I think that is the main thing. Because as you take one opportunity, the next one will arrive and then the next one. So in order to have all these opportunities, you have to take the first one. And even if it's not the biggest one, it is a small one, it's the first step. You're going to start going out there. People are going to start getting to know you. They're going to start recommending you to other people. And that that is the way that I think you have to go about it. Be enthusiastic about being in a place because that is that links with the thing that Lucy was talking about. If you show enthusiasm about a project, about being around people, if you generally nice and polite and kind and make everyone in the room feel comfortable and you're just willing to accept new experiences and go for new opportunities, I would say that that's the best way going on about being a freelancer really is about dealing with people I think like 60% of the job is being good at dealing with people it's essentially you have to be in that place read the room react to the room and try to connect with the people around you don't impose yourself but try and connect as much as you can with the people around you because that is where the opportunities are going to come from as a freelance networking people are going to say, oh, I really enjoyed working with you on this project. I have this other project. Oh, oh, my friend has this project. I'm going to tell my friend that maybe you could work on this. So that, and, and then you start building up this portfolio. Then maybe you can set up a, a website or a little portfolio thing online and you can start posting some stuff on social media because that, that comes up into it as well as a, as a freelancer. And, and that would be that would be my recommendation, really. I don't know if anyone would have anything to add to it, but in general, that's what I think. Thank you, Natalia. And from your experience in terms of like building your network and um, establishing that relationship with clients, is that something that you proactively do? Or do you find people coming to you through word of mouth or is it a kind of a mixture of the two? How does that kind of work? I think as because I had an initial kind of freelance experience with uh, youth, which was a producer that then I went on working regularly with. So that was a bit like he would bring in some clients that was there were his clients and I would eventually maybe get to meet them and they would bring some other artists in or like a guest 
artist and then I would get to know them and later they would recommend me to some other freelance work that wasn't related to to the work with with this producer maybe but uh, if you were just a freelancer and you didn't have a, a producer that you were kind of regularly associated with then that would be a bit different that would be you would have to do a bit more promotion I thought I think you would have to be a bit more out there in terms of oh I'm gonna put this on Instagram because I'm in this session or I'm gonna try to get my website out for people and maybe you'd have to have a bit more of a social media presence I find if you want if you didn't have a regular freelance work with a certain producer as well Thank you. Does anybody else want to add in any comments in relation to that in terms of finding freelance clients or building those relationships? Anybody else? No, okay, that's cool. We can move on to the next question. I'm actually gonna actually pick up on one of the comments you made there, Natalia, which I was, um, I'm kind of curious to know what kind of, what part does social media play in your, in your, in your jobs, in your careers? That's obviously it's, a key thing in society now but how like how important does that factor into your job and kind of building your career and your profile uh, well in terms of like I had to have social media I avoided it for a while I'm not gonna lie because I was like it it takes so much you have to nurture it at to some point and and it's time consuming and demanding and I, I try to escape it as much as I could but because if I was in a session with someone and like I was in a session with a producer or with uh, a musician and I was producing a musician or whatever. And then they brought in some session musicians that had their own artist projects because that is very that very often is the case. Like you have an artist that you're producing and then they bring someone that sometimes they don't have a, a band. They just have people that they know as session musicians, but the session musicians all also have their own personal project. And they would come in and they were like, oh, I really like work with, working with you. It was a great vibe in the studio. I have my personal project. Is there any way that I can find you on social media and contact you so we can maybe arrange something so you can be on my project? And you have to have it. So you have to go like, okay, find me on Instagram. That's my name. Find me on, on Facebook. So I, in order to communicate, even if you don't post every day, like I don't have a regular um, schedule for posting. Often if I have a session, I, I will take a picture or two, post it if it's a nice session, I can take some nice pictures, but it's essential at least to have it to be in touch with clients because most, most people, even if you can email and it's a more formal way, most people prefer the preferred method of contact for people with social media sometimes. And if you don't have it, you might miss out on stuff might miss out on keeping in touch even keeping in touch with the client so they remember that you exist <laughs> like you worked with these people and if you carry on like maybe you post every now and then they're gonna go oh yeah I worked with this person oh I have a new project coming up coming up maybe I can contact them again so it's just a reminder that you're there and a way to keep in touch with people that you worked with and it can be to a certain extent if you want to a, a way to self-promote yourself in case like you're totally freelance and you don't have regular clients, you're probably gonna to need to do a bit more promotion on your social media. Brilliant, thank you. Does anybody else wanna jump in on that topic? Any other comments around using social media to build your profile? Yeah. Okay, um, um, I would say I'm not the best at doing it, but um, from more of an artist perspective, it's really important to be um, like constantly interactive on social media, posting, replying to comments, replying to messages. Um, Cause if you're trying to build a fan base, like, and you're only posting once every few weeks, like people will forget about you or like think, oh, she's not making music anymore. So I definitely say it's really important to like dedicate time to like taking photos, like taking content that you can use. Even though at the moment I'm not the best cause it is hard to like find the time, but like, I definitely recommend doing that. Thank you. And do you do you juggle that as part of your job as well, or is that more for the, your um, for your artist profile? That's more for my artist profile. For the label I work for, we have like um, a dedicated social media um, person who sorts all out. Thank you. And Marta, you were going to say something there as well. Um, yeah, I was going to say that majority of people that I know that are freelancing are relying quite a lot on uh, social media and using that as a platform 
uh, to promote themselves. Um, I know that there are in the industry some management companies. They do management just for freelance people. But I think the most is uh, actually um, how much you put into it. Um, and it's not just about showing people what you're doing, but it's more uh, also about engaging with people that I think works the, the most. Uh, obviously, I don't feel that that much because um, I, I, I'm not a freelance, but if I was, I would probably use social media quite a lot to, to, to do that. Yeah. Thank you. So, Ramira, go on, you were going to say something. I was literally just going to emphasize how important it is to um, be posting about any projects that you've contributed to, even if you feel personally that it was, you know, you had a relatively small role. Um, it's important to shout about it because you're not only helping um, the person whose work it is, but you're letting people know that, hey, look at all these you know, things, I've, p things I've worked on and people I've worked with, and you kind of eventually build up this um, roster slash portfolio um, for potential clients to look back on. Lucy, I would love to hear from you because you're working across multiple accounts. So it'd be really great to hear your insights. Yeah, well, I'm obviously lucky that I get to help run the Abbey Road Institute Social. So it means that I learn a lot about marketing, which I can apply to my music account. And it is so important to like keep up engagement um, to, you know, get more like, the thing is nowadays artists producers you're doing it all yourself you don't have like a team behind you like a label and stuff you do have to learn how to do all those things on your own um and they are so important you know if you want to get noticed by different labels and stuff you probably you have to face it you probably do have to have quite a large engagement followers that kind of thing um and so i would like maybe suggest LinkedIn learning is really great for like short courses on marketing, stuff like that, even just like utilizing the content that you're making, maybe like a marketing plan before a release that you're going to do, even stuff like utilizing hashtags and, and all of those kinds of things. There's lots of ways online to find like little um, tips and tricks on how to really like boost your engagement and kind of get more followers in, which I, th I think you just have to face it, you do need it. It's a really important part of being a musician or an artist or all of those things kind of now. And if you don't feel too overstretched, you know, pop on like all of them. TikTok is where it's at now. You've got to get that. <laughs> if you can become famous on TikTok, you're set for life, basically. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Um, so yeah. Brilliant, thank you, that's great. Um, just a quick uh, time check, just to let everyone know what that's watching. We'll be finishing about 10 minutes. So you've still got time to put a question in the q and I have a few more in there, but um, if I can, I'll see if I can squeeze a couple more in before, before we finish. Um, let's have a quick look. So where are we? Actually, this is a question from Michelle. Um, oh, sorry, where's it gone? For Mia. Um, how do you decide which radio stations get the songs? So how, yeah, how are you choosing or how are you approaching stations to get tracks played? How does that kind of work? Yeah, so usually uh, the artist might have a few suggestions of like big stations that they could see their music fitting. Um, so they'll usually send us their suggestion. And then me as a product manager, I might have a few suggestions um, you know, what other songs are similar and then where have they been played? That's like a good way to look. And then we also have then our radio team or who will have um, a big list of targets, which they have the contacts with. Um, so I'll kind of collate all the all the different radio stations and then the radio team then contact them. Thank you. Um, OK, and a couple more. So I have one from Karis. For those of you working in studios, what is your advice for people trying to get work experience and internships whilst at university? I don't know, were any of you also doing any work placements whilst you were studying or did that all follow after you finished on your courses? Um, I don't know, perhaps Lizzie, Marta, Ramira, do it, maybe one of you wanted to, to address that one? I definitely, all of the studio work that I started doing came after I graduated. Um, so I wouldn't really know. I'm not sure I have the best advice. Um, 
Do you think, know. from a practical perspective, do you think you would have been able to juggle that alongside your studies? Would that be realistic? I'm just... To be, to be honest, no, especially because I came to the Institute with virtually no knowledge about engineering. Um, so, and because it was a year long intensive course, I was really throwing myself into the work that we were doing um, for classes and for, for our various projects. So I actually don't think I would have had the time. Okay, fair enough. So maybe something to think about after study rather than trying to at least maybe trying to apply for it whilst you're studying, but starting actually once you've finished on a course. It also works to your advantage, I think, to go to a place and say, this is what I've completed. This is what I've done. Here are the projects that I did while I was at school. And this is how well I did. Um, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I have same same as Romero. I think uh, I'm, I'm not able to, to give 100% doing too many things at once. Uh, so if I had to study and work at the same time, I would have to to basically um, share my energies in between different things, and probably I wouldn't have done that good uh, at school and then that good afterwards. I don't know. Um, so all the opportunities I got that they came afterwards. So I would say just pick one thing and then give it a hundred percent you as much as you can. Thank you. And De Debbie, do you want to say, do you want to jump in there as well? I um, just wanted to say that with the studio, I think it's really important for them if you're available all the time. Um, because a lot of the time, yeah, exactly, you get last minute staff coming in and they, they ring around and say, who can get here within an hour or something like that. Um, and the other thing, to get this work in the first place, never underestimate the importance of a killer cover letter. Don't just write, dear sir, madam, I, maybe you want, might want me as a runner, you're sincerely blah. Just, um, <laughs> here's my CV. It's not about the CV so much as the letter. You need to demonstrate that you're keen and uh, excited and passionate and what you can offer them as a, as a human being as well. Like you, you need to come across well in your letter. They think, oh, they sound nice. So that would be my advice. Do it after your course, apply at the end. Um, also, I remember I did write rounds to a lot of studios um, after I left and my, my success rate was like one in 20 letters got some kind of response. So write 100 letters, maybe get five interviews and you might get one job, but it'll be good. <laughs> That's great. Actually, just to pick up on that, because this has also come up in for some of the other questions, and you kind of touched on it in the cover letter, but what, what would you say are the things that will make you stand out? Like if, if you to look back on maybe job applications that have been successful, are there things that you feel that you were able to do or demonstrate that helped you get the job, whether that was something in your cover letter or something that you talked about at your interview, for example? What, what do you think the characteristics might be that help put you in a stronger position to get the job in the first place? Debbie, maybe to add on to your, uh, your, your past answer. Um, just be empathy and just being nice to talk to in the first place, not being arrogant, but saying like, yes, I, I, I can do stuff, but I'm not, I don't think I'm all that. I, I, I want to learn. That is it. Yes. Say that you want to learn. <laughs> like I know a bit, but I'm desperate to learn more. I'd really love it. I, you know, I'm free all the time. Really excited about it. Passionate. Um, what else? I don't know. Just things like that, really. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Any other suggestions around things that make you stand out? Um, in terms of applying for and getting jobs because you've all you've all gone through experiences to get to where you are now and maybe maybe looking back there are things that you can identify that helped get you to that point I think one of the most important things is getting that interview opportunity and then when a person is able to speak to you face to face or I guess now like this they can see how your personality shines through and how mm -hmm. eager you are and whether or they, they can gauge. Um, people in studio management, I find, can gauge immediately um, what kind of person you are and, um, and how you can help judge up their team. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that um, more generally speaking, like the music industry, you don't have to be as traditional in your approach, you know, like you don't have to have such a formal CV that has the same, you know, like I'm hardworking, I work well in the team, you know, like don't be afraid to show your personality and like, um, I've done loads of 
career workshops when I was an apprentice and something that always like came up was like show literally who you are like don't be afraid to put a link and show the projects you've been working on show your artist page um you know don't make that the main focus like that's obviously the reason why you want to get in the music industry but just show that you are keen and say for example if you're going for an a and r internship show that you've got a music blog where you've been looking at all the newest artists in your area you know like have that show your relevant experience and why you're so passionate and so keen to get into into that role I think brilliant thank you and do you because obviously you did your internship at um at Universal do you have any other kind of recommendations perhaps maybe from because I assume there would have been other interns at, at the same time as you were there like shared experience or other, other perspectives that they might have shared about their experiences that would be useful to mention as well? Um, I think, again, it's just kind of honing in the point of like networking. I think the people that kind of stay on in the company that I saw were always involved in everything. You know, they were always making as many friends as possible and, and getting involved and, and, you know utilizing social media to follow all the all the social media accounts that posted about the new jobs and you know all of those kind of things um to kind of yeah stay on and get to where they to where they wanted to be just dive right in <laughs> brilliant thank you um okay i'm just having a look through the last few questions that are coming through um okay actually again possibly for lucy how do you gain experience in music marketing when you don't have an academic or professional background in it? Um, so firstly, like luckily the jobs I've had have been quite entry level. So they don't really expect you to have direct experience as long as you have some keenness to learn. Um, but also kind of going on my last point, make sure to do it in your own time. You know, I have my own social media account for my artist page where I, 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 I manage a social media account. I do all those things. I have a YouTube channel. I have a TikTok. I, I can show that the content I've been creating, if a job was going to ask me in an interview, like what, how, what do you know about marketing? I can show them. And again, there are lots of like free online courses, I think around these kind of things with like basic information, or you could pay and do something like LinkedIn learning. Um, and those kind of things you can put on your CV and they look really good to an employer because you're actively like, you've been proactive in your spare time to like get those skills. And I don't think they can ask for anything more than that, basically. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. And okay, we're down to the last couple of minutes. So I'm gonna make time for one last question and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, let's have a quick look. This is quite a big one. For those of you working in studios, what is your favourite part of the job and what is the most challenging? Um, oh, this is a quick fire round. We're gonna, so I think if we stick with what's your favourite part of the job, um, Marta, perhaps if you're happy to go first, super fast. Sure. <laughs> uh, so the best part of the job is um, keep learning and knowing that around me I have such amazing professionals and people that I can learn from uh, and in in depth like more specifically the part of my day that I love the most is um, being in studio one in the morning uh, when the orchestra starts to play that's that's my favorite that makes my day that makes me smile and then then afterwards I know I can have my coffee and you know that's that's that makes me in a, in a very good mood brilliant thank you and um, Lizzie, if I can ask you the same question too. Um, I guess I think just being part of the recording process, um, it's still quite magic to me, just being a part of that creative moment and working with amazing artists. Brilliant. Thank you. And Ramira as well. Uh, I'm going last, but they, the other two said exactly what I was thinking. Um, probably being able to experiment as much as I want to in downtime with gear and getting to know different pieces of equipment, just running my vocal through different compressors and, and things like that um, is so fun to me. And I love just knowing that I have access to um, all of these wonderful tools to help me learn and, and better myself in my career. Thank you. And Debbie as well, because you've, you've had experience in a studio. What would you say was your favourite part? Um, just being in the amazing environment of doing it. I mean, I was really, really just a runner, so I didn't have too much involvement in sessions and stuff like that. But 
I had a bit to do with the artists and that was exciting. It was inspiring just being around all the stuff. Um, having to go on a bit of the gear very occasionally was just really great to learn stuff. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So that brings us back up to 7.30 and so we're at the end of our time. Firstly, I want to say thank you to the brilliant panel this evening. It's been really interesting hearing all of your experiences and your insights um, and sharing your wisdom with the group. Um, I also want to say thank you to the studio for hosting and organising the whole Abbey Road Equalised Festival, which has been a real highlight. Um, it's gone really well. And I know that the studios are already planning um, a whole series of further events which will be coming up as well. Um, if you've been watching some of the previous sessions or you've missed any of them, um, they will be uploaded onto YouTube in the coming weeks. So do keep an eye out on the studios and the Institute's social media channels and we'll be sharing these with you. Um, and one last thing to mention as well is that the studio is actually organising a mentoring scheme um, and you can find more information about that via the Abbey Road Equalise page on the website. Um, have a look through, you can browse who the mentors are um, and you just need to submit a short video to see if you can be uh, signed up as a mentee. So yes, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you everyone for taking part and goodbye. Good evening. <laughs>